In this lecture, we will look at the world's two leading republics during the 1850s, what you could consider to be the calm before each one of them faced a long, protracted war, the United States before the Civil War and France before the Franco-Prussian War. We have covered what was happening in Great Britain during the 1850s, especially in terms of iron construction in the last two lectures. And so I first want to discuss the development of the American cast iron front during the 1850s, and then we'll look at the Second Empire in France. In Great Britain, we saw the first use of an iron column in 1770 in a church, that is, an iron vertical structure for which cast iron's compressive strength was inherently appropriate, as opposed to a horizontal spanning structure, a beam, where cast iron's weak tensile stress limited how far it could span. By 1800, multi-story framing had started to be used in Industrial Revolution factories, and the British would continue to evolve a system of iron post and beam framing for the next 30 years, to the point where it could be considered to be used for tall structures. The first proposal to build a tall tower employing iron was designed in 1832. This was a proposal to commemorate the Parliamentary Reform Acts passed in Great Britain that year that expanded the vote to a significant segment of the population that had never before enjoyed the right to elect their member to Parliament. The tower was proposed and designed by Richard Trevithick, one of Britain's leading railroad engineers. Among his first was the first steam railroad locomotive. Get ready to see this type of drawing on the right for the next hundred years where a projected building is juxtaposed against the collection of the existing tallest structures in the world. Here the Great Pyramid is shown, still assumed to be the tallest structure in the world, which is not true, as we've already discussed. It was Strasbourg's Cathedral. Of course, you have the very British St. Paul's on the left and Nelson's Victory Column in Trafalgar Square on the right which, by the way, wasn't designed until 1839, so this drawing was done after the fact. The dimensions of the conical tower were to be 1,000 feet tall. It tapered ever so gently to reduce the section as it got higher, in response to the moment diagram of a cantilever. From a diameter of 100 feet at the base to a 12-foot diameter at the top, the tower was placed on a 60-foot high masonry base, and was topped with a 50-foot diameter viewing platform that sprouted a 40-foot high equestrian statue. The tower was to be made with 10-foot tall, curved, 2-inch thick cast iron plates that were cast with interior flanges on all four sides. These allowed the plates to be bolted to one another, with a sheet of lead placed between them to account for surface deformations. The panels were also cast with a six-foot diameter circle in the center to reduce the weight of the panel and correspondingly the wind load on the structure. The entire iron exterior was to be gilded with gold leaf, so imagine this great gold spike glistening in the morning sun. Seeing as the elevator hasn't been invented yet, how do you get people up to the top observation deck? You don't have electricity yet, so what type of power do you have? Steam. Trevor Thick's innovative use of iron was to have been complemented by his knowledge of steam power and compressed air that he had gained over his years of designing machinery for the mining industry. There were no stairs provided in the tower, as access to the top was achieved by a piston that ran inside a 10-foot diameter cylinder located at the center of the tower. The piston could accommodate a maximum of 25 passengers who would be whisked up the cylinder at the exhilarating rate of 3 feet per second by compressed air supplied by a steam engine. By slowly releasing a pressure valve, the piston would be allowed to float at the same rate gently back to the ground. A contemporary description celebrated the anticipated experience. Quote, some make a long journey to the Great Pyramids, 500 feet high. How much more pleasant would be Trevithick's proposed floating a thousand feet upwards on an air cushion, controlled by his high-pressure steam engine, and having from the loftiest pedestal of human art surveyed imperial London, 
to be again lowered to the everyday level at a safe speed. Unquote. Of course you hope that steam doesn't escape when you're halfway up or down and come crashing back to Earth. But again, Trevithick was solving the problem with the technology of his time. The project generated sufficient interest and support to actually have been placed before King William IV and was approved with a letter on March 1, 1833. Unfortunately, Trevor Thick was at the end of his life when he had made the design and died less than two months later. His tower died with him. I think Trevor Thick's proposed tower was the incentive for the Americans to propose the Washington Monument the next year. Trevor Thick's tower marks the start of an international competition to have the tallest building in the world which the U.S. quickly joined with the idea to build the Washington Monument. It's going to take the U.S. over 50 years to actually construct it, but it is too coincidental that it comes the year following Trevor Thick's proposal. As soon as the Washington Monument is finally done, we will see that the French will propose to build the Eiffel Tower. Why? Because in 1833 the French had the tallest structure in the world. Strasbourg Cathedral, which at 466 feet high is taller than the Great Pyramid, but until better measuring abilities evolved, it was thought that the pyramid was the tallest structure. So let's say that the French have had the bragging rights for the tallest structure in Europe for the past 150 years. We saw in the last lecture that the Prussians joined the competition with the Hamburg and Cologne cathedrals, but the Washington Monument, when it was completed, had surpassed all in Europe and most logically had also surpassed the limit for masonry bearing construction. Why? The Eiffel Tower is basically twice as tall as the Washington Monument. But which one weighs more? The Washington Monument weighs the same as 12 Eiffel Towers. This fact is the basis for much of the next three lectures. That is, with the invention of cast iron, we are moving from the old way of constructing with solid masonry bearing walls to the new iron skeletal frame. And the weight differential was one of the major reasons, but not the only one, for this change. This is the first time I've mentioned an American building, so we can now start talking about the United States in terms of iron in architecture. We lag behind Great Britain by 50 years in the development of iron technology because why would Britain give us that technology? The colonies were a captive market, so why would they share the technology? So of course, we are going to be held back from technical developments just in order to keep the British industry profitable. But we are going to catch up and quickly surpass both Britain and France. The first iron you will find in an American building will be in Philadelphia in 1822, which was just over 50 years since the first iron columns in Britain which makes sense because Philadelphia was the leading commercial city of the early United States. And iron was used in a very similar manner to the British church, in that it was used as columns to hold up the mezzanine in a theater, a similar type of problem, a heavy load that needed to be supported by a column as small as possible to reduce its visual impact. The use of iron slowly spread throughout Philadelphia, such as this naval asylum erected in 1826. But really the history of iron in America quickly passed to New York City, as did the reputation of being the country's financial center, and we will find New York City developing an iron system that we associate today with the American skyscraper. Similar to the British history of iron with the Albion flour mill fire, New York's interest in iron construction stems from a fire in 1845. New York lost about 20 blocks in an urban holocaust in July 1845, and so owners in New York City are now very concerned about trying to find a construction technique that doesn't burn. The problem, however, is perceived to be not your building burning, but your neighbors catching fire and it's spreading to you. Therefore, what they are looking for is protection from an adjacent fire. The person who will be able to take advantage of this fear is James Bogardus, 
an inventor who spent six years going around Europe selling his patented engraving machine for watches. But what he saw as he traveled around Britain and France was the early development of iron construction, and he came back and developed and patented. It's important to note that he patented a system of cast iron framing that could be used in the exterior buildings, again showing you that the fear in New York City at this time was not your building going up in smoke, but protecting your building from your neighbor's burning building. So what Bogardus wants to do is produce a system of fireproof exterior construction that we call the cast iron front. In the summer of 1847, he developed its design and details, and then began to market it to these merchants who have been sensitized to the need for a fireproof building. He published his design for a four-story building for himself as a market ploy. You can see it consists of cast iron columns, cast iron beams, and glass windows, a significant improvement upon the masonry construction of the period from the standpoint of making the windows as large as possible for we are still relying on the sun and natural ventilation to make our buildings livable. He said that his system was so strong that you could probably eliminate half of the structure and it would still stand. In the upper right, an editorial cartoon in the New York Times made fun of his claim. You can see, obviously, that the cartoonist has gone through and eliminated 50% of the building, and the building is still quite stable, isn't it? Well, maybe not. The secret that makes this system unique are the bolted connections that rigidly connect the pieces together. There are no diagonal cables in his drawing, like those that permeated the Crystal Palace below. He begins with the exterior cast iron front, while the interior at this point is still all heavy timber framing and wood floors. But eventually Bogardus will also replace the wood interior structure with iron and produce all iron framed buildings by the start of the Civil War. He eventually patented the system in 1850, but by this date he had already convinced his customers that his fronts were fireproof. Now why do I say this somewhat cynically? Well, how do you make cast iron? You put it in a huge fire, right? So in other words, what he was trying to say was that if you take a match and put it to the iron, it won't combust. But what we are going to learn, unfortunately, in 1871 in Chicago, is what? That cast iron is not fireproof if you put it next to a huge fire. But we have to start somewhere. So he was able to convince his clients to ignore the fact that you need a large fire to melt iron in order to cast it. We're going to ignore that fact and simply say that iron is incombustible. So clients quickly snapped up this idea, and Bogardus was erecting buildings not only around New York City, but all throughout the United States, because we are now beginning to get the railroad system in place, and so you could ship his iron pieces to anywhere a river or a railroad could take them. The cast iron front is the way you build an urban building in the 1850s. If you go to New York City, you'll find there's still a large area of Manhattan that is called the Cast Iron District that consists of nothing but cast iron fronts. Bogardus claimed the advantages for his system were, one, of course they were incombustible. Number two, it was stronger than masonry, therefore you could have smaller columns or larger windows, meaning more daylight coming into your building, which is important. Number three, you could construct these structures at any time of the year, which is important because until 1884 in Chicago, but I'm getting ahead of myself again, the construction industry must stop with the first frost because everything is built with masonry and water freezes and expands, which destroys the masonry wall. So the entire construction industry stops with the first frost and doesn't start up again until the spring thaw. So construction was very seasonal. With iron, all you had to do was bolt the pieces together. So he says that you can erect his iron pieces at any time of the year. Number four, it is durable. All you have to do is put a new coat of paint on it, as you see over here on the right. So this building is over 150 years old, and it still looks brand new. 
as opposed to the idea of patina, that is the aging of a building that develops over time. Sometimes this will be stylish, but in the 1850s, it was stylish to have your metal building not only look like a new modern iron building, but also sparkle. Number five, you can recycle these in two ways. First, as the value of your land goes up to the point where your building is no longer economical, you can just unbolt it all and re-erect it on another site. Or if it is stylishly unfashionable, in other words, it is designed with Corinthian columns, but Gothic is in style, you can take it down, remelt it, and cast it in the new style. Either way, it's recyclable, so it's an investment that will stay with you, the owner, over time. But from our standpoint in this lecture, his last two reasons are the most important. He said you could build his system 10 miles high before it would collapse under its own weight. And lastly, he said you could make cast iron in any style you wanted, but he didn't realize you could take it the next step and invent a new style for iron. Unfortunately, from a theoretical viewpoint, therefore, he is the first person using a new material, so what we are seeing is the old style still being made, but in the new material, right? So he's more like Thomas Rickman than J.C. Luden. Rickman was the Iron Gothic church fabricator, where Luden saw the future saying that we did not have to design iron buildings with Greek or Gothic styles anymore, right? The best example, I think, of Bogardus's buildings of the 1850s in New York City was the Harper Brothers Publishing House. Once again, it was the result of fire. Let's see. A publishing house, ink, huge reams of paper and paper dust, a steam boiler, just a wonderful explosive possibility. The fire occurred in 1853, so Harper's decided to design a fireproof building by themselves. They approached Bogardus because of his iron structures. It's a wonderful look into the future. Take a look at Bogardus' exterior to see where we're going. It's all repetitive iron and glass. However, it's still done in an ancient style. In this case, it's Venetian Renaissance. But what is emerging now is what I call a more rational architecture, as opposed to romantic, because there's nothing else in this elevation other than structure, right? There are no little pavilions at the corners or anything like that, only for compositional effect. It's the same, column after column, on top of a column. No trying to compose a facade. You really have no choice because it's always the same, right? All you do is pile these pieces up. A much more structural or constructional or rational approach to the design of a building. Lauger would have approved, yes? Remember that change is a two-step process, so Bogardus would naturally copy a historical style in the new material. So I'm not interested so much in what style it was constructed. What I want to show you is that we've got a one, two, three, four, five, six story all iron frame structure in New York City, both interior and exterior. So we've got the iron frame in America before the Civil War in New York City. Now somebody out there has to understand why I said it that way. My point is that you can go to almost any history of architecture book and it will tell you that the iron skeletal frame was developed in Chicago during the 1880s. Nope, New York invented it in the 1850s as I'm showing you. Harper's understood the problem and designed a building plan that compartmentalized the more dangerous functions away from the rest of the building spaces, conceiving of a dumbbell or a binucular plan. They put all of the office functions in the front portion and all the printing and assembling functions in the back half of the building. And then they separated the two parts with an open courtyard where they placed all of the potential equipment that could explode. They also compartmentalized the building horizontally by allowing no penetrations in any of the floors whatsoever. To move between floors or across to the other part of the building, you had to pass through the protective masonry walls and then cross a bridge 
or into the staircase. Both halves of the building were surrounded with a masonry wall, except the street front. Here, Harper's employed Bogardus's cast iron front to maximize the daylight. You can see the result in his drawing. This is what the cast iron front is giving you as an owner. Your space is being flooded with daylight, which means you can use a greater floor depth than the holes in a brick wall allowed. And when combined with taller floor-to-floor -floor heights that made the windows even taller, daylight could reach even farther back into the depth of the building. That is the first thing I want you to remember about these cast iron fronts, the search for daylight. The structure consists of cast iron columns, they're hollow of course, and composite cast and wrought iron girders. Cast iron's great in compression, but it's awful in tension. But wrought iron is still very expensive compared to cast iron. And so what you're actually seeing is a composite structure of a cast iron compression flange reinforced with a tension rod of wrought iron to take the bending stresses. Then how is the floor constructed? Wood burns, so the only fireproof floor material we have at this time is masonry. So he details shallow brick jack arches that span between rolled iron beams, which are some of the first ones made in the United States. Bogardus is very successful and quickly has a number of competitors. The most historically significant is Daniel Badger. So Bogardus and Badger will be the two major contractors of this type of building throughout the United States prior to the Civil War. Badger's best building, it still exists in New York City, is the Hogwarts Building of 1857. And again, you can see the facade or elevation that results from this new material. It is a very slender, linear structure spread as far as possible and infilled with glass. This building is also important historically because it was the first building to be designed to have an elevator in it. Bogardus and Badger are two of the primary manufacturers of this material in New York City, but if you look throughout the United States, you'll find every major city had producers of this type of iron front. This was the way to build if you are going to be up to date in Kansas City during the 1850s. In Bogardus's work, the iron tower and the exterior iron frame merge to produce what eventually is going to become the American skyscraper. The 1845 New York fire had shown how ineffective the city's fire alarm system was, which forced the city to revise its methods. One of the revisions was to expand the city's fire districts to eight in 1850, which required the construction of several new fire alarm bell towers. In the 19th century, what developed in large American cities was a fire watch. You have lookouts looking for fire from an alarm tower. If one is spotted, you ring the bell so many times, telling the volunteer firemen which numbered district the fire is located in. Bogardus suggested late in 1850 that these could be fabricated not of wood, as they had commonly been in the past, but of incombustible cast iron. The city council eventually agreed and contracted him to build a prototype on 33rd Street near 9th Avenue that was completed by mid-August 1851. The tower consisted of a 10-sided, open, rectilinear framework of iron that was erected in seven levels to a height of almost 100 feet. What we're looking at is a multi-story structure of nothing more than cast iron columns and cast iron beams bolted together in a rigid assembly that can grow tall, tall, and taller. Bogardus's bolted connections allowed him to build this stable iron framework without the use of any diagonal bracing, the first documented freestanding multi-story iron frame in the history of architecture, something the British had yet to erect. The other type of building that was very susceptible at this time to the technologies of the era was the lighthouse. Again, many times a lighthouse was built where it was very hard to build with stone, with large waves crashing against fresh mortar. So a wooden tower would be erected, and in combination with an open flame, they easily burned, but they were just as easy to re-erect. Why not use my iron system to erect a tower once and be done with it, said Bogardus. We just load the pieces on a ship and sail it to wherever you need to build a lighthouse. 
So very quickly, he took that same idea and did two versions of the lighthouse. One was an open framework, and the other he enclosed with sheet metal panels to protect the interior. He erected his iron towers as lighthouses all throughout the Caribbean. This ties in with British developments at the time. So now we can start going back and forth between the continents. Remember I told you that the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park had to be taken down after the fair. So what is going to be done with all those parts once it has been dismantled? One proposal was to keep it at Hyde Park, but to re-erect those pieces in a series of telescopic rings to produce a crystal tower. One problem with this, of course, is that the pieces had never been designed to take that type of load, so the proposal wasn't feasible. But nonetheless, it shows you where the mentality of the British was at this time, with at least two proposals to build a tall iron tower between 1832 and 1852. I said we will now start going back and forth between the continents. This proposal appears to have been the precedent for Bogardus's well-known design in the summer of 1852 for the 1853 New York Crystal Palace that incorporated a similar tower of 13 levels that telescoped out of two shorter but wider towers to a projected height of 300 feet that would have been 19 feet taller than the tallest structure then in New York City, the spire of Trinity Church. Bogardus proposed to hang iron chains that would have supported a roof enclosure of sheet metal panels from the central tower to the perimeter of the 800-foot diameter building that would have been a four-story enclosure made with the pieces of his cast-iron system. It would have been an interesting building in a hailstorm, no doubt. But nonetheless, here is another example of Bogardus building a tall iron, multi-story tower. However, it failed to win the competition. The winning design for the 1853 Crystal Palace was a direct ripoff of Paxton's design, with the addition of a dome placed at the crossing of a Greek cross plan. However, the idea for a tower was constructed for the fair. The Ladding Observation Tower was a 350-foot tall wood and iron structure. It was the tallest structure in the country at the time. Remember these two images. We're going to see them again. Do you know where? They were reused as a Trilon and Perisphere, the iconic buildings at the 1939 New York World's Fair. As the old adage goes, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The fair is also important in that in its second year, 1854, the first workable passenger elevator was exhibited. What I mean by an elevator is that there were platforms that were used in barns and buildings and so on that would hoist heavy materials like bags of flour or feed. But people would not use these because they didn't trust the rope that lifted these platforms, fearing that the rope would break. What made the elevator actually usable is a safety system that responded to the possibility of the main hoist line breaking. The solution was designed by Elisha Graves Otis, whose company still is one of the larger manufacturers of elevators. The solution was to place teeth on each of the rails and then grabbers, for a lack of a more precise term, were placed on the upper portion of the cab that were held back in tension by a spring that was connected to the tension in the line. So if the line breaks, this releases the spring, which allows the grabbers to move and engage the teeth on the rail, immediately stopping the movement of the falling cab. The Otis brothers put on a great show three or four times a day. One brother would get into the cab while the other brother, I pointed him out with the arrow at the upper left, would be up above with an axe. The upper brother would swing the axe, cutting the rope. The cab would start to fall. But before you could blink an eye, the grabber stopped the car. The brother riding in the cab would yell, All safe! Take a bow. And the audience would break into applause. Hooray! And so we have the future of the skyscraper secured with this invention. Because now we are no longer limited to five-story buildings. 
what was thought to have been the normal limit that people could comfortably walk up. There was a rent scale in pre-elevator buildings. The higher in a building, the lower the rent, because of the effort required to walk up those stairs. Of course, you could build taller buildings, and a few were erected up to seven and eight stories, but they were warehouses. Nobody would ever walk such heights on a daily basis. But the elevator freed us from this natural limit and quickly reversed the rent scale in urban centers, if for no other reason then remember what the major transportation system in most American cities was at this time. The horse. If you've ever walked along 59th Street in New York City, along the southern edge of Central Park, where all the horses were waiting for the carriage rides, you got a whiff of what it was like to be in a 19th century city before the car, and today they collect the manure religiously. Just imagine what it must have smelled like in any large city and this was before the addition of sewers. So it just wasn't the horses. Needless to say, the higher one got, the sweeter smelling the air was. But we'll hold off on any further discussion on this issue till we discuss the skyscraper in two lectures to come. Otis patented his elevator in January 1861, just prior to the outbreak of the war. What type of building is this? I'll give you a hint. It's not a chimney, nor is it a fire alarm tower. These kind of structures you don't see anymore, but you do see them in every 19th century American city. Get any 19th century bird's eye panorama of a city, and you'll see these towers dotting the horizon. This is how you make buckshot. This is a shot tower. Traditionally, you would build a 150 to 200 foot tall masonry tower. At the top, you would place a floor, then melt lead up there, and as you pour it through a sieve, it breaks into small droplets. As it free falls, gravity shapes it into a sphere before it hits a pool of water on the ground that then solidifies it as it cools. That's how you used to make buckshot. The only problem is that a masonry tower of this height weighs a lot, so as long as your site has good bearing capacity, there's no problem. But in 1855, the McCulloch Shot Company in New York wants to build a tower, but they found out that the site they had purchased was a filled pond and can't support such a load. Here is where Bogardus understood the advantage of his iron skeletal system. It weighs a fraction of what a corresponding masonry tower did, and he could erect one of his towers on their intended site. So he proposed an iron tower similar to his fire alarm towers, but added a masonry enclosure to make sure that the wind didn't blow the hot lead into the street. He erected eight levels of his iron system, and then put a 12-inch thick brick wall on each beam. This is important. The brick has now been divorced from the ground. It is no longer load-bearing all the way to the ground. It is floating on iron beams in the air. It is no longer, nor needs to be, self-supporting. It is a curtain wall, not a bearing wall. This is a very profound difference. And voila, we have what will be called skyscraper construction, because I can build an iron tower of unlimited height and enclose it with these thin masonry panels. Coupled with the elevator, Bogardus' system of iron framing, supporting its own masonry curtain wall, will have no limit to how tall we can build it. So in New York City, prior to the start of the American Civil War, we have developed the technical systems that will result in the American skyscraper. The detailing with which Bogardus supported the brick on the iron frame manifested a subtle, but very significant semantic and conceptual difference from embedding an iron member within a masonry element, a technique the French had first developed with great success and was now being employed by their architects at this time to structurally reinforce masonry enclosures. Nonetheless, some architectural historians still don't consider this tower, which, by the way, Bogardus erected a second one the following year, to be a building so they tend to discount Bogardus' work in the history of the skyscraper.
The towers are followed three years later by Bogardas with a two-story warehouse for a sugar company that he designs and erects in Havana, Cuba, that is a building. In 1858, he was commissioned by the Santa Catalina Company to design and erect a sugar warehouse in Havana. This would be the largest building he would construct, two stories high with a plan that measured 400 feet wide by 600 feet long. The difference between Bogardus' detailing and that of the French is quite apparent in his first building, in which he employed his new masonry curtain wall. There were no masonry bearing walls in the entire structure, therefore it was entirely framed with an iron frame composed of cast iron columns and composite girders with cast iron top flanges and a bottom tie rod of wrought iron, very similar to the girders he had used only four years earlier in the Harper's building. As is easily seen in the few existing photographs of the building's construction, its exterior enclosure consisted of brick panels that were supported on the iron beams, as he had first done in the shot towers. Grain warehouses, the Chicago term grain elevator will emerge after the Civil War, are one of the most dangerous types of buildings because grain dust can be highly explosive. Therefore, iron would seem to be a perfect material from which to construct this building type, and Badger, once again, whose factory was basically across the street from Bogardus's, copied Bogardus's details using the shot tower system of exterior brick panels on an iron skeletal frame. Extruding it to a height of seven stories in a grain elevator in Brooklyn in 1860, he will build another one for the Pennsylvania Railroad in Philadelphia in 1862. But I think the building that best exemplifies antebellum iron construction in the United States is A.T. Stewart's new Iron Palace, a department store in New York City that he erected in 1859. Stewart, the country's largest dry goods merchant, likened the white-painted Iron Renaissance elevation to puffs of clouds. Costing $2.75 million, and with eight floors, each having over two and a half acres of floor area, it was easiest the largest store in the world for the next decade. Its size allowed Stewart to have at least 19 separate departments, giving substance to the argument that it, and not Paris's Bon Marché, whose construction did not begin until 10 years later in 1869, was the first true department store. Stewart's new store was designed around a central atrium that ran from the basement through all of the floors that were accessed by double staircases. The atrium was topped by a glass skylighted dome, and together with the cast iron columnar structure, created a vast open interior open plan that was filled with continuous organ music. Stewart's iron building was gutted by fire on July 14, 1956, revealing that the vast majority of the building was indeed skeletal framed solely in iron in the interior as well as in the exterior. My point is that the three critical technologies needed to build a skyscraper, the elevator, the iron skeletal frame, and the masonry curtain wall, had been developed in New York City prior to the start of the Civil War. The only reason that a skyscraper was not constructed in New York City before the Civil War was simply that there was no demand for a building that could contain a very large amount of floor area on a relatively small site. This pertained, however, only to America at this time, for as the American population was actually thinning itself during the Civil War, there were locations in Europe where the population was exploding, in essence creating a demand for just this type of building. This was exactly what was happening in Paris during the 1860s, to where we will continue this lecture.